Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. The handout reference during this presentation is available for download on the audio section of our website. Our speaker this evening attained his Master's of Divinity and Master of Arts degree in Moral Theology from Mount St. Mary's Seminary in 1989. Ordained to the priesthood in that same year, Monsignor Pope has served at several parishes in the Archdiocese of Washington and was named a Monsignor in 2005 by Pope Benedict XVI. He has served as pastor at Holy Comforter St. Cyprian Parish in Washington, D.C. since 2007. He also blogs regularly at blog.adw.org, ADW as in Archdiocese of Washington. And if you haven't read Monsignor Pope's blog, you should. It's full of wonderful stuff. You, you update it almost daily, right? Sometimes twice a day, right? It's, it's, it's great. I've been reading it for a long time, and uh, you should too. So please join me in welcoming back. It's always a pleasure to have him back. Monsignor Charles Pope. Today we're going to talk about the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, we'll see that they come from a biblical root. But before we get into the seven gifts, I mean, just think about, we're, we're at the Feast of Pentecost, and some people call the Holy Spirit the great unknown. They know Jesus, they know the Father, but the Holy Spirit, Luke, let the force be with you, you know, right? The Holy Spirit, of course, is not a force, he's a person, right? The third person of the Blessed Trinity. We always sing of him at benediction, you know, genitori genitoque, laus et jubilatio, to the, generated, or to the generator and the generated, let there be praise, procidenti abutroque, uh, sida benedictio, to the one who proceeds from them both be also blessing. See? So we always, uh, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. The Father loves the Son, the Son loves the Father, and so powerful is their love that it's literally another person, the third person of the Blessed Trinity. The Holy Spirit is the love of God, the life of God, the joy of God, the wisdom of God, the power of God, the serenity of God, the, the glory of God. Amen? Amen? You know, three images that come up, two of them in the readings tomorrow, but there's a third image that the Lord supplies but elsewhere. But the first image is rushing wind. It says they were gathered in the upper room, and suddenly a strong sound like a rushing wind came through the house, you know, and... What's going on here? Well, divine CPR, that's what's going on, okay? You have a, humanity's been dead in sin. St. Paul says you were dead in your sins, huh? And so now the Holy Spirit, after God's great work of redeeming us, rushes in like divine CPR to bring life back to the church. And it goes back to the book of Genesis. God had scooped clay from the earth and formed Adam and then breathed, breathed into him. He became a living spirit. What the Hebrew word for spirit is ruach, and you've got to do that in your throat when you say it. <laughs> ruach. You, it's, it's the breath of God, and none of the animals receive that. Only the human person. See? And yet they lost it. And we were dead in our sins. But now Jesus sends the Holy Spirit like a rushing wind, and, and He resuscitates the dying humanity, and starts with the church, and again, it brings life to those uh, who were struck down in fear and dead in their sins, and yes, Jesus had redeemed them, and now comes time to, if you will, bring them back to full life. So the first image is rushing wind. The second image is the tongues of fire, right? Now, first of all, fire. Listen, y'all, God is a holy fire. That's what the Bible says. God, the book of Hebrews says he's a consuming fire. Now, how are you and I going to ever enjoy the presence of God? Well, we're not unless we become fire. <laughs> and so God sends tongues of fire to set us on fire and to bring us up to the temperature of glory. Are you praying with me? <laughs> now, go with me to the book of Malachi. I'll show you why this is important. There are two different groups on the same day that God visits the earth in judgment. 
The book of Malachi, the very last chapter, says this. Lo, the day is coming, blazing like an oven, when all the wicked shall be burnt up, leaving neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, that day will arise like the sun with healing in its rays. Why? See, two different groups experience the same reality very differently. What's the difference? One group's already been set on fire. And they say, hey, the weather's just fine. You know, temperature's perfect. Right? The other group is like, ah, melting, I'm melting. Okay. Now, I don't mean to be, <coughs> you know, flippant there, but you see the idea. You've got to be prepared to go into God's presence. A lot of people say, God's not good if he sends anybody to hell. Listen, i got news for you. Unfortunately, it's better for them in hell. It'd be worse for them in heaven. That's the greatest tragedy of all, isn't it? How could they endure the presence of God's... It was a burning furnace of charity and love if they are not on fire with love themselves. And so the tongues of fire come at Pentecost. Rushing wind to bring them back to life. Tongues of fire to bring them up to the temperature of glory. And then... There's another image that the Lord gives of water. He talks about on the great feast, he said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me, and I will give him drink. For it is said of the Messiah that out of his side shall flow living waters. Now, John then says he was talking about the Holy Spirit, who hadn't come yet, but would come. For the Lord had not yet been lifted up. And there on the cross, soldiers thrust the lance in his side, and there came forth blood and water. A kind of a Johannine Pentecost for the church. You know, Mel Gibson did that powerfully, didn't he? It's kind of gross, but all it comes spraying out all over, uh, out of his side, and they all fall to their knees in a kind of a Pentecost event, just, just being filled with the Holy Spirit of God. John says when Jesus died, he gave over his spirit. Now, we hear that expression, we think that means he died. Yeah, but it also means he gave over his spirit. See? So he said, I'm going to give you my spirit. And John describes that moment at the crucifixion. But you see the idea. There is this special coming now at Pentecost. But the beauty of water is this, that you have a hunger in your heart, a thirst, and nothing, nothing in this world can ever help you. Just can't fill the bill, because you've got a God-sized hole in your heart. You, you, you cannot, nothing in this world will ever satisfy you. That's your deepest experience. You've got a longing that just won't be satisfied by anything in this world. And so Jesus says, now look, I've come to put a fountain of water welling up in you to eternal life to satisfy that thirst, that, that hunger and that thirst in you. And like all water, it gives life. But isn't it beautiful? A lot of the fathers of the church say that the Holy Spirit, the image of water, water adapts itself to every living thing it encounters, but itself remains unchanged. Water is just water, H2O. But it enters a plant and has one set of effects. It enters us and has a very different set of effects. And even among us, this water of the Spirit enters and it lights up in some of us parenthood and some of us priesthood and religious life. And it lights up administrative skills. It lights up preaching and teaching. It lights up all kinds of va values and virtues and all the different things that are needed in the church and in the body of Christ. All those different gifts. Yet one Spirit. And so water is like that. It's one thing, but it brings about many different effects. So three images for the Holy Spirit today, because I don't want to get so lost in these seven gifts that we're still being very technical. I want you to see that the Holy Spirit, again, is the wisdom of God, the love of God, the joy of God. He is, he is the, 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 the food, if you will, of God to satisfy, the water of God to slake our thirst. He is the one who comes to live in us in a temple and just light us up. Bring us up to the temperature of glory. Bring us back to life, of course, through resuscitation. And, if you will, slake that endless thirst that we have within us. All right? So within that, then, we talk about these seven gifts. Now, let's begin to go through the, the slideshow. And also, you've got a handout. I know that's hard to see for a lot of you, but... All right? Yeah, the seven gifts of the Spirit. It's from Isaiah in the 11th chapter. Speaking of the Messiah, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, 
a spirit of counsel and might or fortitude, a spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord and his delight will be the fear of the Lord. So we, we have then this wonderful quote from Isaiah and through church tradition and so on, we've taken up then this understanding that there are, there are these sevenfold gifts of God, right? The, uh, the septiformis, uh, the, 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 sevenfold, the septiformis munere, the sevenfold gifts of the Holy Spirit. One spirit, but bringing about these effects. Now notice that some of them speak to our intellect and some of them more to our heart, okay? So we have wisdom and understanding and knowledge and counsel. Those speak to our intellect, right? And we also have then piety and fortitude and fear of the Lord that speak to, more to our heart, right? And so the, the God is, if you will, speaking to us and giving us these gifts. And these gifts, uh, we'll see, uh, let, let's make some general observations and then begin to go through them. Now the first one is that the gifts are supernatural, and thus they transcend ordinary powers of the soul or the human person in general. Now, in saying this, it's important because some of the seven gifts sound a little bit like natural virtues. For example, one of them is named the very same thing, fortitude. There's a natural virtue. Remember, the, what are the four cardinal virtues? I gave you one. Prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude. Those are the four cardinal virtues, right? I heard some of you calling them out. Now, Fortitude is, again, a, a, a virtue in the human person that even pagans noted and can, can, can reply to. But the gift of fortitude, which is the gift of the Holy Spirit, that is a divine gift, and it comes from God directly. So it may tap into our natural fortitude, but it's over and above a human virtue. All right? Another uh, of the virtues is prudence. It sounds a little bit like the gift of counsel. Okay, but again, we're trying to show that, yes, there are, these may plug into some of our natural or human virtues, but the gifts of the Spirit are works of God in us. They, have, they, are, they work with a divine mode, div divino modo, a non-humano modo. We'll look at that in a moment. Now, it says that there is, this slide also teaches us that they are infused. That is to say they're poured in. To say something's infused means to be it's poured in by God so that no soul could ever simply acquire them on, their, on our own, you know. In this sense, then, they're different from the virtues that can be acquired. How do we acquire virtues? We just repeat, good things, good habits. Uh, the, virtues can be acquired naturally, but these seven gifts are, if you will, mm, poured in by God. They're given, they're given to us. Now, that's not to say as we'll see, that there aren't some things that we can do to hinder these gifts from coming to us. And likewise, there are some things we can do to dispose ourselves for these gifts. But at the end of the day, it's God's work in us. All right? Now, let's go on to the next slide. And, um, now, in the case of the gifts, it's God, God is the unique mover and cause. I've already said that. We're only the instrumental cause. I have a picture of David playing the harp there because if you're hearing music, let's say you hear a piano playing. Okay, what is the um, what is the um, uh, formal cause and what's the instrumental cause? So okay, let's let's uh, the instrumental is actually pretty easy. If you're hearing a piano, what's the instrumental cause? <laughs> the piano. So what's the formal cause? The piano player, right? By the way, Fulton Sheen always had this beautiful image. He says modern science. Uh, so many of them have become unbelievers. He says, you know. They, 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 they seem to forget that they hear the music of the piano, but they never want to ask who's playing it. See, they're hearing the notes and, and so on, right? So, again, we have to see. So the formal cause of these gifts is God. We are the instrumental cause. That is to say, he plays, if you will, the, the beautiful music with our life through these gifts, okay? So God is the formal cause. We're just the instrumental cause. All right, now... They, they, they proceed from us materially. In other words, they act in a human way. You'll, you'll see human wisdom we, or uh, fortitude and so on. They're, they're, they're observable working through a human person in a human way, but they have God for their cause. All right. Now let's move on to the next general observations, and we're going to get right into the gifts here in a moment. Um, okay, what's the purpose of them? The purpose of the seven gifts is to perfect in the Christian person all the virtues, and to bring him to a godly life, not only in name, but in mode and substance. So, you ever hear this expression, I'm only human. <laughs> you're not only, not if you're baptized, 
you, you already begin, you, you share in some of the divine nature. You're not gods. Don't, don't run around like you're a god. You're not going to get a planet when you die and any of that stuff. But you, you have a share in the divine nature. Every time the priest makes that prayer, you know, uh, may, uh, through the, the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ who humbled himself to share in our humanity. I think it was St. Athanasius who said this. Only saints can talk in this daring way. But he says, God became man so that man might become God. Okay, now, un understood, in a qualified sense, do not absolutize that statement, but you get the idea, right? So, you're not only human. There is a spark of God in you. For, you're made in the image of God, but even beyond that, after baptism, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you, and He plays your life, if you will, like a beautiful instrument. And you, 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 you begin to share, not just in human perfection, but in godly perfection. We begin to think more like God thinks, and to understand and have more of God's priorities. And we walk among those uh, who, are, who see us, as St. Paul said, like sparks or, or uh, uh, you know, shining in a darkened world, you see? So, again, there is, there is this idea that God wants to, again, bring us up to the temperature of glory and help His glory and His divinity shine through us. So the purpose of the gifts, then, the seven gifts, is that we would be uh, godly, not in name only. You are all such godly people. That's just words, right? But to actually be. Remember how John puts it this way in the first letter of John. He says, Brethren, we don't know what we shall later become, but we know this. We shall become like him, for we shall see him as he is. And likewise, he says, What a glory that we have been, uh, we, that we have been called to the children of God, and not simply called, but in, but in fact we are the children of God. And so again, all of these are ways of saying, What is a child? A child shares in the attributes of his father. And that's our glory. So the Christian then is transformed then into an image of Christ by these gifts, not in symbol, but also in reality. Walking the earth, he identifies with all the sentiments of Christ and comes to resemble Christ. At least that's the goal. Now, would anybody see anything of Jesus in you? Well, <clears throat> you decide. Now then, let's get into the gifts themselves uh, as we begin. Yeah. We're going to begin to look at them. But remember, now there's seven. They come from Isaiah. They're not just pulled out of thin air. Uh, they, are, they do appeal to the two fundamental aspects of our inner life, namely our, our mind, our intellect, if you will, and our will or our heart. Okay? So we'll see how we're going to start with these gifts that begin in our, with, uh, that particularly bless our intellect. But obviously, our intellect then informs our will. Right? All right. Now, with that in mind, what is the gift of wisdom? And by the way, let me just quickly distinguish it between wisdom and knowledge. People use the word wisdom today, they throw it around. But in the theological realm, we're a little more careful with how we use wisdom versus knowledge. Hmm? Um, wisdom is distinct from knowledge in terms of its object. So wisdom pertains to God and the things of God. Whereas knowledge pertains to this world and the things of this world, but the gift is, is how they relate to God ultimately, but the fundamental object are the things of this world and how I as a Christian can come to know them and, and see how they plug into my vocation and help me to make my way through God's created order. Okay, But the object of knowledge is the world and the things of the world. The object of wisdom is God and the things of God. So that's the first way that we distinguish them. Now, there comes a moment, though, in the Scriptures where Jesus says, um, remember that parable he tells about the guy who knew he was going to be turned in because he was rooking his master, taking some, skimming off the top? And it, he, he does some devious stuff. And he, he uh, cuts the accounts and he earns some friends for himself because he knows he's about to lose his job, right? And at this, the, Lord's, uh, the Lord gave him credit for wisdom. Some of the translations say, and it's an accurate translation. But St. Thomas points out in the Summa, there is a worldly form of wisdom that we more properly call cunning. See, there are those in the world that are wise in worldly ways. Sometimes we use the word wisdom to pertain to a worldly wisdom, but Thomas is quick to point out, we don't, we're not talking godly wisdom there. We're talking about a word that's better translated cunning or trickery knowing how to navigate, get things to go your way, no matter who gets hurt. See the idea? So every now and again, even in the scriptures, that word wisdom gets applied 
in, in terms of the world, but it's almost always referring to a form of cunning. It's, it's used negatively. It's I used ironically. So just to get back, just so we can distinguish before we talk about wisdom itself. First thing we want to know about wisdom is that it's object. In the theological language, is God and the things of God, whereas knowledge is the world and the things of the world and how they, we can relate them back to our spiritual life. Now, first then, first of the seven gifts, the gift of wisdom. The gift to appreciate more fully, this is in your hand out there if you have trouble reading the screen, the gift to appreciate more fully the truths of faith and to discover their treasures and their sublime harmonies, Likewise, by this gift, we can humbly recognize the limits of our own intelligence and rely upon God's infinitely wise teachings in faith and in trust. Now, look, through the gift of wisdom, you and I receive the gift gradually in the stages to become, to think more as God thinks and less as the world thinks. God says this in the scriptures, my ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are my thoughts above your thoughts, and my ways above your ways, says the Lord. Now I say, oh, that's the case. Well, bag it. I guess there's nothing we can do, man. <laughs> see you later. No, but you see, again, he's speaking to man unaided by grace. But you, you and I, have received the grace of the Holy Spirit so that little by little we, get, we receive the mind of Christ. We begin to think more as God thinks. We begin to have more of God's priorities. We see things more that, the way God does. Now let me give you a quick example. St. Paul says about the cross, which is partially hidden there, but you see the cross. And the cross is, he says, to the Gentiles, it's an absurdity, and to the Jews, it's a stumbling block. But to us who believe, it is the wisdom. It is the power of God. See? Now that requires a journey. Some years ago on my blog, I was, we were talking about suffering and the the role of suffering and, frankly, some of the, the unusual gifts that suffering can bring. And, and an atheist wrote and he said, I'm an atheist, and I want you all to know you are stark, raving crazy. <laughs> the cross is absurdity. Absurdity to the world. Absurdity. Foolishness, stupidness. What do you mean suffer? So this is where physician-assisted suicide is coming from, all these kinds of things. To the world, suffering has almost no meaning at all. It is to be almost at all costs done away with now. See? But for us, we've got to get back in the business of holding up the cross, y'all. There are too many Catholics who are ashamed and embarrassed of the cross. So someone comes to you and says, hmm, you mean to say that if, if a person's gay, they can't get married, they've got to live like a celibate? Yeah, that's what we're saying. Well, that's hard. I know it's hard. But you know, with grace, it's possible. And it can be a beautiful life. We're afraid to say yes and hold up the cross and say, I know it's hard. But you know, great things come through the cross. Or, you mean to say that a woman who's been raped can't abort that child? Yeah, that's what we're saying. Well, that's hard. Yeah, it's hard. And we're, but they, they, they object and we run, we run for cover. Instead of taking the cross and saying, I'm sorry, but I, I glory in this. I've had my sufferings and I know what they've done in my life and I don't wish suffering on anybody. And we've got to be like Simon and Cyrene and help folks carry the cross, but we can't deny the cross. The cross is the wisdom of God. It's the power of God unto salvation for us who believe. But you see, that's where wisdom comes from. The world is like, ah, crazy, you're crazy. But all the more reason we have to, who understand God's ways more, have got to begin to ask for the gift of wisdom so that we understand the cross. We understand suffering. We understand sin and how awful it is. We understand and we have better priorities. But anyway, even among Christians, look how some of us pray. Oh, Lord, bless my finances. Oh, I'm having trouble paying my bills. Oh, Lord, uh, you know, my health. I just got a cancer scare. Oh, Lord, help me, help me. And we all go into panic mode about things like health or money or possessions. Why don't we ever get in panic mode about our sin? <laughs> See, we don't have God's priorities if we're not careful. Jesus looked at a paralyzed man and he said, Son, have courage. Your sins are forgiven. <clears throat> Uh, Jesus, uh, his problem is he's paralyzed. Oh, I didn't even notice that. <laughs> you see, God doesn't see things the way we see things. He doesn't necessarily have our priorities. He's not necessarily just on all of our little agendas. See what I'm saying? And wisdom turns that inside out and you begin to become 
more on God's plan. You begin to think more like God thinks. You begin to take sin more seriously. You also cherish and love grace, and you're so grateful for mercy because you see what a glorious thing it is, and you start to understand suffering, and you, 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 you're like anybody. You want to try to avoid it, but when it comes, you understand it, and that God's permitting it for a reason and a season, and you face it with courage, or you help somebody else to face it with courage because you're beginning to think more like God thinks, and you're beginning to have different priorities. You, you want to pray and you want to study Scripture. You thirst for this knowledge. And you're excited. It lights up your mind and you're starting to connect the dots. You say, wow, God, I see what you said over there, how it makes sense over here too. And I understand now what you meant when you said this over there. And you start to connect the dots. Welcome to the gift of wisdom. Wisdom. To begin to think more like God thinks. To understand more like God says. Now, you'll never understand perfectly like God does, but you get the idea. Well, get on God's page. Now, there's no substitute for this. You know, obviously, it's a gift from God, but it can be facilitated by the study of Scripture, by coming to classes like this where you hear a crazy priest yelling. <laughs> but you, you see, we can dispose ourselves. But at the end of the day, Lord, I need wisdom. I, I know people with three and four theology degrees. They've got no wisdom, y'all. They're, they're cynical, they're always questioning. You know, we've had a lot of real bad theologians lately, you know, for the last hundred years or so, who have been very negative on God's revelation, and they're always critiquing it. I don't know why they call it the historical critical method. <laughs> now, I'm exaggerating, but it, critical means a little different there. But you see, there is this sort of what they call this hermeneutic of suspicion and of doubt, and we have to figure out why God didn't really mean what he obviously said. And there's a lot of that today. So just because a person's got a theologian or they got a degree doesn't mean they're wise. And likewise, just because somebody doesn't have a degree doesn't mean they're not wise. Now, I'm not, I'm, I know a family member who had very little college education. She had no college education. She was wise. She knew God. She loved God. And she understood God's ways. That was my grandmother, Nana. Good, holy woman, see. And everybody knew. Nana just had a wisdom about her, huh? No big degree behind it, but that gift to say, I know the Lord. I've met him, and I know he's going to see you through, and I know it's going to be all right. See, And she knew enough to pray. All right, I've got to move on. I'm spending a little too much time on this one particular gift, but you can see how important it is. Amen? Amen. All right. Now, we move on. As I said to you, the, let's just look at a few sins against uh, the gift. <laughs> You're going to kind of laugh a little bit, but... Uh, uh, some sins against this gift would be stupidity. <laughs> now, here's two. We've got to rescue the word a little bit. In modern English, stupidity just is kind of a foolish, ridiculing kind of word. But stultus, stultus in the Latin means to kind of trip over or stumble. And again, remember how the cross is absurdity and the stumbling block and that idea. So people trip. There's, you know, it's a kind of a sense of, if you look at the root meaning of the word stultus, in Latin, it means they're astonished or blinded by the light. You know, that kind of a sense, right? So, and this comes from a kind of a cultivated refusal to understand or learn or listen or at least try to explore, okay? So this is what we mean by stupidity. It consists of a certain defect of judgment and a lack of spiritual sense that prevents one from discerning or judging the things of God, all right? And again, blinded by the light might be an image for you, all right? You get so used to the darkness and you live in a darkened world, that when the lights come on, you're like, man, what's that? What? I turn that thing off. <laughs> See? But it's the glorious light of truth. It's God's beauty. Turn it off. See? And that's stupidity. Stultus. You know, like that. Stumbling. Now, worldliness is, again, a preoccupation with the thinking of the world and a negative judgment on God's ways based on that. I got an article coming out on the register about eight common errors today in the church. And unfortunately, i got news for you all, unfortunately, too many people judge the gospel and the teaching to the church by the thoughts of the world. That's exactly backwards. You're supposed to put the world on trial. Remember Jesus said, when the Spirit comes, he will convict the world. Is the world on trial for you? So many people come, I think that teaching is just harsh. And maybe it is, but you see, thank you, maybe it is, but why, is it, why do you see it as harsh? Maybe because you're used to the darkness, you know. But there's this... This te you know, a teaching is given, and they just react. I don't, I, and I, ask, I mean, how many Catholics have never even thought to look up the catechism and say, well, let me find out why this is taught. Well, 
a nice idea? No, it's convicted because it doesn't agree with what I've learned in the world. Now you see that's backwards, right? You're supposed to go out there and say, this doesn't make sense, it's not what I learned from the Lord. See, we have it all backwards, okay? And so again, worldliness is a terrible attack on wisdom, right? And then likewise, folly. A foolishness, in other words. It means the total negation of wisdom. Uh, there's a, the word... See, unfortunately, again, in English, we have this word fool. And we, we mean by fool, an idiot, a stupid dolt. But really, in the Bible, you either are wise or you're unwise. So, for example, the Latin word for foolishness is insipientium. The, the Latin word for wisdom is sapientia. The, the, the Latin word for what we translate as foolishness is insapiens, to be unwise, to not be... To not be rooted in wisdom means to be a fool. And it doesn't mean to be a ridiculing thing, right? It means that you haven't attained to the wisdom of God. And you should seek for it, all right? Now look, all of us struggle to understand some of the teachings. This is a journey we're on. But wise people say, Lord, I don't know everything. Will you instruct me? Will you help me? All right, let's move on. Knowledge. I've uh, said to you that... Um, the, uh, the object of knowledge, it helps us to know God and His will through the world that He has created. And we see how created things then relate to God and how they reflect His loving plan. And then we develop a sense of His presence and His purposes. So, as you walk through the world, y'all, we, we are not walking through a machine. This is not a machine that we're in. We are walking through a loving work of creation. And creation is revelation. Now, uh, we, the, the Protestants say Revelation is the Bible. It's a book, it's a book, it's a book, it's a book. All about the book, the book, the book. The Catholic Church has always said the first book of creation is creation. I mean, the first book is the book of creation. Now, St. Paul refers to this in the Scriptures, Romans 1. He says, you know, the pagans are without excuse because although they didn't know all the details of the law, they're without excuse because they could come to know God plainly in the things that He has made. And they could see His wisdom and His divinity in all the things that he's made, so they are without excuse. And so, again, we are not simply a people of the book, we are also a people that, see, and everything that God has made, there is order, there is purpose, there is glory, and we, the gift of knowledge helps us to navigate the world, not just the natural world, but even our human world, we start to see glimmers of God in one another. We start to appreciate what God is doing in human events, that history isn't just some blind thing that God's observing from the distance, saying, oh, shuck, did they really do that? I mean, God's involved in our history. He's at work. Things like prayer. How many of you have been following you know, the teachings of Fatima this year? And you know, our, our Lord sent us some information there, and God's at work in the world. And he's teaching us things through events like wars. That if we don't pray, our life will go badly. If we do pray, our life will improve. And people are converted. So again, the gift of knowledge is able to navigate this world with all of its complexities, all of its beauty and all of its glory and all of its gory, and somehow find God in all of this. And again, connect the dots. So again, notice that definition in front of you. It helps us to know God and His will through what he has created, right? You can come to know something of the creator in what he has created. We see how created things relate to God and they reflect his loving plan. If you read history, church history, you can start to see what God's up to, see? And you start to see how things are unfolding. And we start to see how all these things reflect his loving plan and we develop a sense of his presence and his purposes. In other words, you don't walk through creation or, or among your, your family in a mindless way. You walk through and you see signs of God everywhere. You become a mystic on the move. This is a gift of the Holy Spirit that you should seek. Because this gives you a sense of meaning, a purpose. You know where God is, what direction things are moving. See? You know, there's an old saying, you know, we're always saying, God, bless this project. Bless what we're doing. Lord, bless this. Lord, help us raise money for that. When what we probably should say is, Lord, what are you blessing? I'll go do that. See? And that's part of the gift of knowledge. You start to, where are you at work, God? What am I learning? How do I see this? And help me, Lord, to get on board with that. But well, I've got to keep moving, but you see the idea, yes? Let's look at just some quick um, sins against not the gift of knowledge. You know, it, what we might call vincible ignorance, right? Which can be so because individual occupies himself with vain or simply curious things or 
in human sciences without any moderation, right? If I can't see it in a microscope, it don't exist. Really? Well, do you know that you just made a metaphysical claim that you can't see in a microscope? You cannot prove what you just said, that the only thing that exists are things that I can see. That is not a physical claim. That is not a scientific claim. That is a metaphysical claim. And don't you dare get on my territory. <laughs> <laughs> Now you're on my territory, and I'm going to just tell you, you can't disprove metaphysics by using it. <laughs> okay. All right. <clears throat> Likewise, intellectual presumption. We think we know everything about everything. We think we got all the facts. We just know. We're, we're so smart. Yeah, right. You know? How many of you have been through the nutrition stuff? You know, Coffee's good. Coffee's bad. Wine is good. Wine is bad. Chalk is good. Chalk is bad. And you know what? The latest reports are that maybe salt's okay after all. All right. Hey. <laughs> Doctor, I, I cut out all red meat. No more salt. I'm not drinking anymore. Will I live longer? No, it'll only seem that way. <laughs> yes, Lord. Again, we tend to become very worldly in our thinking if we're not careful. You see the idea, right? And, 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 and you see how the world's always shifting and changing anyway. Why not get on board with the Lord? Now, the gift of understanding. Th this is the gift that helps us to grasp more clearly the things we already believe by faith and to see their implications and their fuller meaning. This is basically what theology does. Theology is, you know, uh, St. Anselm, I believe, said that theology is fides querens intellectum, faith seeking understanding. We, we, we meditate, we seek to understand more richly and more deeply. All right, God, I've heard what you said and what you commanded and what I'm supposed to do and not supposed to do, but now can you teach me to understand why you teach that? And that's when things start to get rich and deep. You've heard me before on this, but too often we've been in the church of the 50s and the early 60s, and I, I came at the very end of all that. I remember a little bit of it, and then kind of shifted in the 70s, but to the other extreme, frankly. But there was kind of this, argue, everything was an argument from authority. Well, the church says this. Okay, then we, we believe. Uh, the church says you've got to go to church on Sunday. Oh, then we go to church on Sunday. Now, back in the early 60s, that argument from authority kind of held some weight with us. But I don't know if you remember, we had this little like, cultural revolution in 1968. And it wasn't just about sex, it was about authority. Question, authority. So if authority is saying, it's all the more reason to deny it, right? So we, have to, we had to retool a little bit. And it's a beautiful, in a certain sense, it's an invitation from God to say, look, parents, you say, we got to go to church on Sunday because it's a rule. All right, but really, why do you go to church? What do you get out of it? What do you think God's up to in asking us to go to church? Why does this rule make sense? See? Well, God wants to teach us. He wants to feed us. He wants to gather us with brothers and sisters and help us to know that we're not walking alone. God, you could think of thousands of reasons that it makes sense to go to Mass. And that's part of the gift of understanding. You start saying, ah, I think I understand more. This makes some sense to me. Or even more arcane things like the, whole, the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. You know, if God is love, and the Bible says he's love, if he's all by himself, it's pretty hard to be love. <laughs> so it makes sense that there's a community of three persons, right? The, one, the, the generator and the generated, and the one who proceeds from them both, to use the very technical language. In other words, the father who loves the son, and the son who loves the father, and that's the third person who is love himself. <gasps> you see, and it starts to connect and make sense. You don't solve the mystery, but it makes more sense. If God is love, for him to be all by himself up there doesn't sound like love. Because love is always related to another. You see the idea? And I'm not here to teach you on the Trinity. That's next week for you. I mean, that's next week's feast. Um, and you probably have a better theologian to come for that one. But you get the idea. Understanding, you start to say, ah, some of this is making more sense for me. I'm resonating with this more. I get this now. Now, now, it doesn't mean you've solved every mystery and you've got everything, every detail figured out. But as I made my journey, I'm like, wow, man, this, this system of God, these teachings, they really make sense. It's, it's glorious the way it all works together. Thank you, Lord. See? And that's the gift of understanding. Now, again, some sins against that would be, um, well, lust. Why is lust a sin against understanding? Well, St. Thomas says in the Summa, that the sins of the flesh, namely gluttony and lust, are not the most serious sins. Uh, the sins of the spirit are more serious. But the sins of lust are the most disgraceful for two reasons. First of all, because they, they involve what we share in common with beast, food and intercourse or sex. But they also are the most um, uh, debasing because of the way they can darken the intellect. 
They're just a very direct way that lust and gluttony can darken the intellect. Now, a simple example of, about gluttony. You've had a huge meal. I mean, you had a big turkey dinner on Thanksgiving. I know, you're doing serious praying and theology after that, aren't you, right? <laughs> right? You, the first thing you want to do is go to bed, right? And so, again, there's a kind of a gluttony, you know, that, that just weighs, it weighs us down and we become heavy, you know? Not just physically, but mentally. But obviously, drink has a way of messing with our mind. You drink too much and your mind's going to be out to lunch. All right? But when it comes to sex, St. Paul describes it quite, quite vividly in, Revela- in Romans chapter 1. He says, look, he says, uh, claiming to be wise, they became fools. Their senseless minds were darkened. And uh, uh, they, they began to, uh, men began to have sex with men and, and, and women were having unnatural sex with women. And in and, 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 and all this, their senseless minds were darkened. And we're living in a very dark time today. And you see how central sexual confusion is to the darkness, Right? I mean, stupid, foolish, un- and, and unbelievable things that even just three years ago we would have said, are you crazy? So, j- transgender, what the heck is that? You know, I mean, who, what are you talking about? That guys can go into a, a girl's restroom or a shower. What are you talking about? You're crazy. People are like, no, look, man, I'm serious. I mean, that's dark. And you start to see that. So you see the sin of lust can be a very powerful a darkener of the intellect. and We're not going to be understanding much of God's ways. And so you see, when you want to live a sinful life, you're going to often find that you don't want to understand God. You don't want wisdom. <laughs> you don't want knowledge. And you sure don't want understanding. Because if it starts to make sense, you might have to like change your life. And so, again, there is this tendency that we have that we want to tell ourselves that what we're doing is really okay. And so we acquire teachers who will tickle our ears. We will not tolerate sound doctrine. And the reason for it is because we want, it, it, it offends the way we want to live our moral life. It challenges us too much. So you see the idea. So uh, these types of uh, sins against the gift of understanding, sins of lust and of gluttony. All right. Moving on now, the gift of counsel. Um, the gift of counsel helps us to make good decisions, particularly in difficult circumstances. We come to know what must be done or not done in specific cases by minimizing uncertainties and puzzling things which may arise in applying the general norms to specific situations. Now, this is very much like the gift of prudence, right? Would you please listen carefully? Prudence is not the same as caution. Prudence is to know the best way forward given the circumstances to my goal. Okay. Now, in other words, sometimes bold action. Prudence will say bold action is called for here. It's not caution. It's bold. Other times, prudence will say no. uh, Work carefully and go around this way. But you're always moving towards your goal. The point is you're goal-oriented. You want to get to heaven. And you want to take as many people with there as as you can, right? So what are you going to do? Well, the gift of counsel is related to the gift of prudence and it builds on it, but it's a work of God. It's not a human virtue. It's a work of God where God begins to pour into you. And yes, he builds on experience and your studies, but at the end of the day, God gives you good sense about the best way forward. And you know there are just some people who are very good at this. I mean, you come and they can sit and listen and they just know the right answer. They just show you the way. They just point out the right way, right? Okay. And then you start to see that, um, I hope you've discovered, at least I have, because I have to do a lot of counseling as a priest, and I've been at it almost 20, 29 years now. I'm in my 28th anniversary, so I'm heading in my 29th year. And I will say, and I, I don't mean this by a boast at all, I'm, I'm shocked to see, but I've gotten a lot better that when people come to me with co- very complex issues or complicated spiritual struggles, and, but I, I, I've learned over the years to really help them through and make, make good decisions. And again, it's not me, it's just the gift of God. But it does build on our experience. It's rare to find somebody with the gift of counsel who's like 10 years old. All right? <laughs> but, but the point is maybe they can give good counsel to fellow 10-year-olds. But, so there is some relationship to our, our knowledge and our wisdom and our age, but again, there are people who are old who don't have this gift. Hello? You know them. You wouldn't dare go to them for advice. Shame on you if you do. All right. But again, although it may tend to build on that, it really is the gift of God. And it is one of these great gifts. But again, all of us should look for it in our life 
that as we learn to grow in wisdom and understanding and knowledge, that counsel comes along with it and really helps us to help, first of all, ourselves make good decisions. I've got a goal in mind. I want to die loving God and my neighbor so I can go home and be with God forever. Now, how do I get there? See? Well, I see an exit that says Sin City. Hmm. (laughs) Now, again, it's not always that obvious, right? So there may be some more subtleties, but you begin to know. And you begin to sort out. And as a confessor and a spiritual director, I've had to help people sometimes sort out great subtleties. Because frankly, most of the stuff we do, 98% of it, we've got mixed motives. It doesn't mean you have good motives. There could be some bad stuff mixed in. And what's of God? What's of the world? What's of the devil? And what's of the flesh? You know, that's what discernment means to sift or sort or distinguish. That's what the word discernment means. So, Again, this is a gift that God can give to us as we make our journey. And if we're faithful, if we're faithful, we can in every way see that this gift becomes more and more alive. All right. Now, uh, time is going quickly, so I've got to uh, continue to move on. Just some real quick listings of these. I won't develop them as much. Incorrigibility means you refuse to be correct, corrected. I will not be. I am. How dare you correct me? You know? So you're not really going to get good at counsel if, you're un- if you nobody can ever correct you. Right? Likewise, rash judgments. It's just the opposite of counsel. You just rush to judgment. You don't have any of the information yet. You just rush to judgment. Welcome to modern culture. Rash judgments. Likewise, pride. We esteem our own judgments a little too highly. And then just plain stubbornness. We just refuse to change our behavior um, when we know we should. All right. Now, we move now into, we, we're leaving the area of what we might call the intellect, and we're moving more into the heart. And the gift of piety Again, just to see the definition you have there on your handout and on the screen. Piety inspires us with a conviction that God is our Father, Abba, hmm? who helps us. We gain a genuine affection for God, and we learn to depend on Him and trust Him. And this leads us to be dedicated in serving Him and spreading His glory and loving our neighbor out of gratitude for God's goodness. Listen, it's a gift to just love God with a tender affection, with a beautiful affection. I don't, have, have any of you noticed, and when you read the Gospels, that Jesus was crazy about His Father? He really loved them. He was always talking about them. You see, the gift of the Holy Spirit is the very love of God. The Father's love for the Son, the Son's love for the Father, literally a third person, and He's in your heart. Oh, so you, you just let Him take over, and you start to just love God. I really love the Lord. You have an affection for Him. You love to talk to Him. You love to think about Him. You love to pray. And you call him, you know, that word Abba doesn't mean just a word. It's, it's, you could teach a parrot to say the word. It's not the word, it's the, it's the experience. Abba is the family term for father. I, I, when my father was alive, I didn't say, hello, father. How are you today, father? I said, dad. You know, he was my dad. I, 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 I didn't call him father. I mean, that's too formal. He's my father. He's my papa. We, he always signed his letters to us, El Dado, you know? <laughs> But you see, the idea is that we're to be able to call God Abba. Father, I love you. I love you. And I want you to know that I went through a period in my life when I was afraid of God the Father. Oh, man, he's like that really mean guy up there. You know? And um, Jesus, well, he was all right. A little severe at times. Uh, Let me run to Mother Mary. (laughs) All right. But be careful, because Mary's going to bring you back to Jesus, and Jesus wants to bring you right to the heart of his Father. Jesus loves his Father. Think of the parables... Uh, the prodigal son, he's saying, this is what my father's like. Even when you give him the middle finger, pardon the expression, but that's what the first son did. His father says, look, I still love you. I'm going to look for you to return. When you come to your senses, I'll be here for you. And the second son, brash and angry. And the father's pleading, come into the feast. I love you, son. It won't be a party without you. And Jesus is saying, that's what my father's like. He really loves you. He even likes you. <laughs> See how we've overused love today that likes even more? Meaningful. <laughs> Crazy. God doesn't just love you, He even likes you. And so somewhere, deep down inside, just you develop this love for the Father. Tender love. That's the gift of piety. And ask for it. How much the Holy Spirit wants to give you this, right? I made a journey, and now I really love the Father. Of all the three persons of the Blessed Trinity, I think I'm really closest to the Father. I just love talking to the Heavenly Father as my Father. I just love it. See? So again... I, I, say, I tell you, I just say that as a witness. If you're struggling, because, you know, fatherhood's in crisis in our culture, right? And that might affect how people understand the Heavenly Father. Just get on your knees and say, Lord, give me a tender affection for, you, for the Father. Holy Spirit, just give me that. Just give it to me. 
And he'll go to work, see? All right. Now, uh, some vices opposed to it, I, I, I want to quickly move because I, I say we have to, impiety, namely anything that involves a de de deliberate infraction of our duties to Almighty God can be called impious. But basically, you're, you're treating God like you don't love Him. See, when you really love somebody, you want what they want, and you love what they love, and you love who they love. See? And so, in a certain sense, all sin is a form of impiety, right? And if I could just love God more, I don't even want to do that stuff. You know, we're always, the saints said, if God wants it, I want it. If God doesn't want it, I don't want it. Do we talk like that? <laughs> How come I can't have it? It's not so bad. Everybody else is doing it. Does that sound like somebody who loves God? <laughs> right? If you love God, you, wanna, you want what He wants, and you love what He loves, and you love who He loves, even your enemy. All oh, right, wow. Okay, likewise, hardness of heart, where we just harden our hearts against God. We just stay in our anger, and we feel so right, and we I won't listen. Something didn't go my way. You go away, God. You know, that's hardness of heart. And, and then ingratitude. Y'all, God's been so good to us. Well, everything didn't go my way. Listen, every moment of the day, God's giving you air to breathe. He's got the Van Allen belts up there keeping the harmful rays of the sun so we don't cook. He's got Jupiter and Saturn out there catching comets for you. And inside your body, every cell of your body, every part of every cell, every atom of every molecule of every part of every cell is up and running and doing everything it needs to do. And you say, huh? And God says, hey, what am I, chop liver? Come on. I, every day I give you 10,000, 10 trillion blessings and one thing goes wrong. You know, we're so ungrateful, ungrateful, right? Look, get in easy. Look, give me more gratitude. You've been so good to me. <gasps> I'm just astonished how good God is to me. And when people ask me, how you doing? I say, I'm pretty well blessed for a sinner. I mean, God has been so good to me, you know? Okay, fortitude. Uh, the gift. God gives us courage and patient endurance in carrying out all of our duties. And it also helps us to overcome difficulties that arise in the Christian life. Indeed, it helps us to endure even arduous tasks for the glory of God and the good of souls. Fortitude was particularly important for the martyrs. Now, again, there's a natural virtue, one of the four cardinal virtues called fortitude. And it's similar, but this is different because it's poured into you by God. It builds on that and makes of it a, a divine work that goes beyond what ordinary humanity could accomplish. So, fortitude is more than just about courage in the middle of a big crisis. But sometimes fortitude is just slugging on when things are hard and people are hard-headed and people aren't listening and you know, you, you, you really, you know, you're living in a culture like this. You've got to have a lot of fortitude. It's kind of discouraging sometimes. And still you press on. That's fortitude. It means to endure. It means to be strong even in the face of difficulties, of pushback, of all kinds of things. It means to stay strong and keep moving the mission forward. See? So it isn't just about courage when there's shots being fired and I'm running around rescuing people. That's great. It's nice, but it might, might also be rash. <laughs> but at the end of the day, fortitude is more of, than just bravery. Fortitude is strength to endure. It's endurance. See? And we get quickly discouraged if we don't get a lot of results. See? Right? And so somewhere along the line, this great gift of fortitude that God gives us to endure and to see things through even when they're hard or difficult. I got news for you all. Life is hard. <laughs> oh, really? See, we're very comfort, we're very comfort oriented, right? But one of the five hard truths that'll set you free, life is hard. That's number one on the list. I've given a talk on the five hard truths. You can look it up. It's somewhere in there, okay? In the collection here, I've, I've preached on that before. Number one, life is hard. And you've got to have strength to endure. Otherwise, you get depressed or you get angry or you just give up or you start drinking. You get the idea, right? Or you say, what's on TV tonight? You try to medicate yourself, just anesthetize yourself, right? It doesn't work, does it? Okay. So fortitude, that gift to endure, be strong in the face of opposition. All right. Now, to endure danger, yes, but to mainly it's, be strong in the face of opposition. Look what Jesus had to face, right? Up on the cross, they plucked my beard. I can count all my bones, you know? But still, he saw it through. Now, some vices opposed to it are timidity and sloth. Timidity means, you know, just a, a, an or, an inordinate fear of suffering. That's timidity. Or rejection, which is a form of suffering. Isn't that really big today? Oh, people might not like me. What, is that in the job description of being a Christian? Everyone's supposed to like you. Is that, where's that in there? Oh, wait a minute, it says here, oh no, Jesus says just the opposite. If the world hate, will hate you, hmm, then people don't like me. Okay, 
And then sloth is a sorrow uh, or, or sadness against the good things that God is offering us because, well, it seems like a lot of work. It might take time. So that's sloth, right? Okay. Uh, the final one, the gift of fear. Now, pr- that word fear, you've got to rescue it a little bit, right? Okay. You've got to rescue it. Fear is, really, the word reverence comes to mind. Um, the fear of the Lord is very frequently mentioned in the Scripture, all right? Now, basically, it means to hold God in awe, in awe. Now, there is some fear of punishment in that, but it's a, it's a fear rooted primarily in love. I love God. I don't want to offend Him. I don't want God angry. I, I, not that He gets angry, but you get the idea. I, I don't want to be in a, in a state of alienation from the God I love. I love Him. I, I, I want Him to be pleased. And, and so, uh, the gift of fear inspires a deep reverence. I love the Lord. I want what God wants, and I don't want to get out of God's will, and I love Him. And there's a fear, not so much of being punished, which is a servile fear, but there's a, there's a fear of offending a God that I love and reverence and respect. I'll give you a quick illustration. I think it was my, my, my sixth birthday. We were living in Chicago at the time, and I loved the tall buildings that were being built. John Hancock building had been built. I think Sears building was still on its way up. But uh, anyway, I remember going down there. Mom took me to the highest place. We went all the way up there to the John Hancock building. We had lunch downtown. It was a great day. But like kids at six, of age, six years of age, I got a little crabby towards the end of the day. We got home, and I went for the cookie jar. Mom said, nope, that'll spoil your dinner. And I said, I, I slammed the lid down. I said, you're mean, and I hate you. <laughs> and I ran to my room and slammed the door. And no sooner did I slam the door than I just had this awful, awful feeling that... And it wasn't so much I was afraid of being punished. It was my birthday, and she was in that kind of a mood. But um, I just felt awful. My mother had been so good to me. How could I have said that to her? I didn't hate her, and I love her, and I was happy, and I was grateful. And so I went out with tears. I was crying, and I said, Mommy, I'm sorry. And she gave me a big hug. And that's a little bit what we're getting at with the fear of the Lord. It isn't so much that we're cringing and afraid of punishment. Now, by the way, if that's all you got, would you please go with it? (laughs) I mean, you know, sometimes that's all people got, you know? And and you say that in the act of contrition, right? Not only because I fear the loss of heaven and the pains of hell, right? But most of all, Lord, because they offend you are so good. That's perfect contrition, right? They, they, They offend you. You're so good. You've been so good to me. And I just don't know what gets into me sometimes. And Lord, I love you. And I don't, I don't want... I don't want to be in that state of alienation from you. See, I really love you. And that's the fear of the Lord, okay? So it, it's a fear, but it's rooted in love. And maybe another way of understanding it is to hold God in awe. <gasps> God, you're so glorious. You, the things you've done are so amazing. Far-flung galaxies and so many glorious things you've done. <gasps> Lord, I, I just, I'm amazed at what you do. Lord, I want to get to know you. I, I'm, I'm a number one guy in your fan club, and... I love you, and I, I want to know more about you, and I'm amazed at what you've done, and I'm amazed that you've loved me, and that you created me, and that you, you sent your son Jesus to die. I mean, wow, wow, Lord, I love you, see? And I just, that's awe, right? That's wonder and awe. And then comes from that a kind of a holy fear of offending someone that we love and hold in such esteem and respect. And that's a beautiful gift, and the Holy Spirit can give that to you, all right? And again, the final sins that we can mention then would be pride. Of course, we elevate ourselves in regard to God. It's pretty hard to, when you're full of pride, it's pretty hard to love anybody, frankly. Pride is a real killer of love or of respect or of holding somebody else in awe. Are you clear on that, right? Pride is a pretty big obstacle to that. Hey, I'm something. Beating your chest, look at me. And then someone else comes along, yeah, yeah, you take a number, I'm better than you. All right. <clears throat> pride and then presumption. It injures divine justice by inordinately trusting divine mercy, right? So, you know, we just pal around with God and think he's just a... Look, do not, do not mock God. Do not trivialize God. That's against the fear of the Lord, right? God is holy. God is very holy. And we have got to, if we're ever going to be able to enjoy his presence, we've got to be serious about growing in holiness, about letting the Holy Spirit set us on fire and bring us up to the temperature of glory. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to endure God's presence. So, do not trivialize God. Do not act presumptively. God doesn't care. God will just forgive me. That's not a way to hold God in awe. Okay? And then just simple irreverence, you know, where we just fail to give God and holy things or people associated with him due reverence and honor. Now again, 
you know, when we just walk into a church and we just treat it like an ordinary place or we say stupid things about the saints or we're scurrilous and we misbehave or we treat priests or religious sisters with contempt or anything like that. Those are some of the things that we want to be careful about because even though the, especially the human beings associated with God are not sin-free, uh, there's still a, a respect for the office that we should hold, all right? So all of those are ways of saying that we reverence God by also reverencing holy people or at least people who have a holy office and those who have a, and holy things and objects and so on, okay? All right, then uh, just, we, we, we just cry out. This is the word from the Veni Creator. It's just one of the lines, you know. Your sevenfold gifts, O Lord, pour forth in us. Yeah? So, tu septiformis munere infunde. Huh? So, Lord, give them to us. My hands are open, Lord. Go to work. See? Wisdom, understanding, knowledge, counsel, piety, fortitude, fear of the Lord. Give them to me, Lord. I need them. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for these gifts. See? Enthusiastically lay hold of these things. But you see how God is about giving you a new mind and a new heart. And these are the seven ways that, that God works to do them. And, of course, there are other ways, but again, these, uh, I gave you the fruits of the Holy Spirit to look for. That's, this is not a class on those, but just a little bonus for you, all right? And, but again, the idea is ask for these things. Come to know what they are. Lay hold of them. Seek them and ask God for them. Thank you, Monsignor. Thank you very much. Thank you, okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist. Pray for us.